Well, hello, hello, hello. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to Brokenomics. Uh, I am here today with Edward Dutton. Hello. Uh, evolutionary psychologist. Uh, actually, you tell me what you are. Yeah, I suppose I'm an evolutionary psychologist. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but Professor Ed, Ed Dutton, uh, who, who, a man who knows a thing or two about intelligence, because, you know, I've got this seeking suspicion that on Brokenomics, we are always talking about broken systems, things going wrong, quite possibly there is a, a more fundamental cause to the ones that we've been discussing up till now. Um, and that would be fun to get into. So, so, Ed, about 30 years ago, I found myself in school and we were being taught that um, selective breeding was a thing. And that, you know, you could take dogs or sheep or cattle or whatever it is, and you could breed in or out certain characteristics that you wanted or want, get out ones that you didn't want. Now, one of the boys in the class, he stuck his hand up and he said, um, does that apply to humans? And he was told quite emphatically, no. And um, I sort of, it was, it was then me who sort of pushed back and said, well, surely it does because we're all animals. And I was told emphatically, no, but I didn't get a good answer as to why. So I've been waiting 30 years for an answer to that question. In 1914 in Derbyshire, parents started withdrawing their kids from a school because they were concerned that the girls were being taught eugenics and they thought this was too sexual. And, and now you're being told it doesn't exist. Of course it exists. We are animals. We are an advanced form of ape. And if you can breed dogs, who are, by the way, very genetically similar to us in the overall scheme of things, of course you can breed humans. And the heritability of psychological traits on average is 0.5, which means it's 50, basically it means it's 50% genetic genes, 50% environment. Um, and the heritability of intelligence, for example, is 0.8 um, in adults. Um, and the heritability of some personality traits is 0.7. Um, so of course you can breed it, yeah. So 20% so 20, 20 of my intelligence comes from my environment. A big part of it is that you create, and why it's uh, 0.8 in adulthood, not childhood, is that when you're a child, your parents are creating your environment for you. And so they, nice. could, they could be more intelligent than you or less intelligent than you. On average, they're about the same, but they could be more or less. The point is they're creating the environment or your school creating the environment or whatever. <clears throat> Whereas once you move away, uh, you're an adult, then you create an environment that is consistent with your own innate intelligence. And that means that your IQ, as it were, can either rise or fall. So you might get a, I don't know, a, a, a child who's the child of drug addicts who's brought up by middle class adoptive parents, and, and he will be a, a very intelligent child, but then as he, IQ child, but then as he goes into adulthood, he will fall, his IQ will fall, because the parents won't be there to create his environment, and so he'll start to create a less intellectually stimulating environment consistent with his own IQ. But 20% of it is to do with an intellectually stimulating environment. So what, what causes in people fundamentally to be intelligent or not? Well, a big part of it is, is, is genetics. It's, it's, there, there are certain uh, alleles, uh, we've identified some of them, um, that are mm. polymorphisms that are basically, uh, they're associated with, well, with, with, let's say, having a PhD, which is basically a marker of intelligence. And we can, we know what these polymorphisms are, we can identify them. And I, I know a couple actually who are deliberately breeding children, um, uh, uh, the Collinses, uh, are, are based on, on, on embryo selection. So they, they, get, they, they get a load of embryos, they find out which one has the polymorphisms with very high IQ, and they implant those ones. Well, you, you, you could run tests and see which of the selected embryos is higher intelligence. Yeah, for sure. So you can get, you can get a woman, you can induce them, you can cause a woman to produce a, a lot of eggs, yes. um, and then you, you fertilise those eggs. And if you're already like a reasonably intelligent couple, then you can you can go through those eggs and you can still just just by chance which one has the the, the prevalence of, of those particular alleles that are going to make it the most intelligent. Right, and then you, and then you the absence of other in the absence of other things, yeah, yeah, well, you can right. you can select for other things. This couple in question are deliberately selecting for autism. They're both autistic and they want their child to be autistic like them. Uh, um, right. Anyway, so so they so they they they, they then get the most uh, intelligent embryo and 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 that's the one that's implanted. What do we think about? Hardware versus software, because look, let, let's let's take. Uh, I, I, I'm going to pick as my intelligent person Magnus Carlsen, uh, the chess grandmaster. Mm -hmm. Clearly, um, the hardware is extremely good. But let's say I had a time machine and I took him and put him with a, a Stone Age family. Mm -hmm. They don't have language. They don't have mathematics. They don't have a lot of the mental software that allows you to manifest intelligence. So. Is it, is it possible that even without a hardware upgrade, 
we will continue to get smarter because the software that we're running in our head gets smarter. I, I don't know that we're, um, what, what you mean by continuing to get smarter? Okay. On a very long time scale. A very long time scale. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, well, I don't know about that, but I'm not yes. sure about that either, to be honest. Um, I, if, if you are not, there's a window in which a child must be taught language. And if the child is not taught language in that window, they can never learn it. Uh, and so one of the problems that you used to have with children that were born deaf um, mm. is there is a window in which they can learn language. And if they're not taught sign language or whatever in that window, they don't, they can't be taught it. They, 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 so essentially their brain becomes retarded. They can't be taught it. They, and therefore there's a degree to which if you don't have, language is a thinking tool. And so there's a degree to which almost like it's difficult to learn to think. So it's like a muscle atrophy. Like a muscle atrophy, yeah. And, and now that, that's very unusual, obviously. That's extremely yes. unusual, like extreme neglect or just very bad luck or whatever. But in general, even if you, because, um, if, if you put, even if you put someone in a terrible environment, if you get someone that has genetically, mm. a genetic propensity for high IQ, and he's brought up by two very low IQ parents, and I know a case of this actually, um, then what that will do is that will um, that will mean that you know he'll do badly at school. He won't do very well. He won't be particularly intelligent because he'll he'll be at the minimum of the environment of his phenotypic possibility for intelligence. But once he moves out of that environment, then you have to called the Wilson effect, which is that genetic uh, traits become more salient with age, um, particularly with intelligence. And so then he will just be a late developer. Then his intelligence will come out as he gets older and he starts creating an environment that is more consistent with his own innate intelligence. Okay, but to, but to my point, let, let's say there is something else coming down the track. If so we, we've, got, we've got language, we've got mathematics. If there is another fundamental thing that we discover, perhaps with our help of AI or whatever it is, if, if we discover another mode of thinking, People from past that point will look back on us now and they, they will see us as somewhat retarded because that whatever that software model was didn't develop the parts of the brain that would allow that like we would look at Stone Age people now. Well, yeah, that's that's quite that is true. I mean, this is the, what's called the Flynn effect. So um, Jim Flynn. So the, hmm. what we noticed across the 20th century is that IQ uh, scores are going up. We weren't becoming more intelligent, but IQ, sc IQ scores were going up. And the reason for that was that intelligence is a bit like a pyramid. You have at the base of the pyramid these specialised yes. abilities, things like pattern spotting, things like that. Then you have linguistic and mathematical and spatial, and then you have G, the general factor of intelligence that underpins the, 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 to which they all, they all correlate. Okay. Um, and what was happening across the 20th century was that we were creating a more scientific environment. We were basically donning what Flynn called scientific spectacles. We were being forced to think in a more analytical way which kind of imitates intelligence in a way. Um, and so if you talk, he quotes examples of this, uh, Flynn, so a, a Russian, and, and you try to give him a basic logical proposition, like um, a, a, a bears, th th there are no bears in, uh, in Austria, uh, uh, Vienna is in Austria, are there bears in Vienna? Like a yeah. basic logic, and they can't deal with that. They just can't think like that. They'll say, well, there could be bears in Vienna, I don't know, it depends whether but there's a market there that has bears. They can't think like that. Mm -hmm. and, we, and, and, we, and we have been uh, taught to think like that, and it mimics intelligence. And so in that sense, we will, you're right, we will look back on people like that and think, God, they're stupid. They weren't stupid, but there is, a, there is an environmental component to it, which they just weren't latching on to. So you, you mentioned something there. IQ is going up, intelligence is going down. Is, is I, it... no, no, not anymore. But um, until uh, about 1997, Yes. Um, in Western countries, um, IQ scores were increasing uh, because of the imperfect nature of the instrument, mm. um, but intelligence was, was going down. And now we now have a negative Flynn effect, i.e. even IQ scores are going down. Now, we've, we've just come off the, the podcast, which will be a week in arrears by the time people watch this particular episode, but we, we talked about a number of the reasons why the incentive structure is the way it is. But essentially, you were describing how the only people with you know replacement rates, I mean, I'll, 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 I'll let you do it, but essentially, we've designed a society where the incentives are to become less intelligent, but we appear to be designing a, a culture that requires greater complexity. Yes, this is a bit of a problem. So what what's going on is um, there is a, there is a there has been since probably about the 1920s a, a weak negative correlation between fertility and how many children you have. Uh, sorry, between fertility and uh, social economic status, or uh, fertility and intelligence. So about minus one, minus point one in women, or minus point two, and so we're gradually becoming less intelligent as a consequence of this 
relationship. And there are a number of things that are causing the relationship. So one of them is, yeah, is contraception. People that are highly intelligent have more impulse control. They're more able to use contraception. They're more able to use it correctly. You know, do you take the pill at the exact same time every day, which is what you're supposed to do? Or do you knock it back with a glass of red wine when you think about it, when you remember? Right. And that's the difference between getting pregnant and not getting pregnant. So that's one reason. Um, another reason is feminism. Uh, the, the low IQ girl drops out of school and starts having loads of kids with loads of men when she's very young, the more intelligent girl. She's becoming a mother in her late 30s while the, the contemporary is becoming a grandmother. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, the welfare state. The welfare state means that you can aff- these people who have very low IQ um, can afford to have, and they are incentivized to have by virtue of more money per child. Uh, lots of children, and they do. And the result of that is that uh, if you divide society between those where both parents are working, IQ about 100, those where one parent is working, 90, those where both parents are on welfare, 85, and those where both parents are on welfare and there's interventions from social workers and the police, i.e. the criminal underclass, there is only they of, the, of those different groupings that have a, above replacement fertility. So we, we've designed a society essentially where Due to the peculiarities of the fiat system, we need to constantly expand money. We've designed a fiscal system where old age is subsidised um, through pensions and NHS, and young age is, is heavily taxed, essentially. So we've designed a system where we must have more workers, but the only people who have an above um, replacement fertility rate are those with an 80 IQ, and we're making up the difference with peoples from the rest of the world who might not be at the upper end. Uh, yeah. And that's another thing that's reducing IQ. So when I do the research, I, I, I'm i talking about natives. So I'm talking about na- native yes. English people or whatever, white people. Uh, but if you look at the average, if we take, if we hold the average IQ of a British person at 100, <laughs> that's the Greenwich mean, uh, then the average IQ of an immigrant in this country is 90. A non-white is 90. So it's lower. So that is also reducing intelligence. That doesn't bode well for the next few decades. No, I mean, it seems, uh, uh, based on the estimates that we've done, my research group, it seems we are losing one IQ point per decade. So we have lost three. Now, that, what does that do? It does more, than, it's greater than some of its parts in a way, because if you lose three IQ points, so we've lost three IQ points in three decades, that halves the percentage of the s- people that have an IQ of above 130. Now, that's important because the correlation between a, the socioeconomic success of a society and its average IQ is about 0.57. But the correlation between the success of a society and the IQ of its smart fraction, its 95th percentile and above, yes. is about 0.66. So the, the smart fraction is more, and we have maybe halving the smart fraction every 30 yes. years. Um, the smart fraction is important because they're running things, they're directing the society, they're the ones that are, that are, that are coming up with new and innovative ideas, yes. the geniuses, or at least those that can add on to what the geniuses have done. Um, and those people are going down and down and down. And so eventually, if that continues, you get to a point where you can no longer do what you used to be able to do. Yes. And then there's a, and then it's a sudden collapse where people, you know, you can imagine that uh, tiny little mistakes in a, in a lower, in a society of, in, of a declining intelligence quotient, you know, leaving one screw off a path of an aeroplane after thousands of flights of plane crashes. Well, you're getting, you're going to get more and more and more of things like that made worse by the fact that the people that are running, the, the pilots are going to get stupider. The people that are designing the planes are going to get stupider. Everyone's getting stupider. Well, I wanted to ask you about that because, you know, I, I was going to frame it in, you know, what sort of IQ level do you need to be certain things? You know, like a, a, a labourer, a tradesman, a pilot, a chess grandmaster. Well, this is, yeah. And what I want to know is, poss- with a possible exception of the chess grandmaster, are each of those going lower in IQ as we go forward in time? Well, it's slightly complicated. Um, yes. I talked about this in a book I did with Bruce Charlton called The, the Genius Famine. So we've lost something like 15 IQ points between 1880 and the year 2000, um, based right. on reaction times. We have reaction time data from 1880. We have it all the way through. Uh, we measure it reaction times in the same way across time. So Relax, this is, this reaction is, this is, is highly correlated with intelligence. Well, no, it's not high, it's 0.3 correlated with, 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 with IQ. Oh, but it's good enough. But it's, it's very good. It's, it's very, right. very reliable. And so and what we can say, what that means, 15 points of one standard deviation, that is the difference between, let's say, a science professor, 130, 
and yes. a, a, a high school teacher of science, 115. Or it's the difference between uh, the high school teacher of science, 115, and the average person, 100 policemen, uh, firemen, um, bog standard office worker, whatever. Or the difference between that kind of person and 85, that's low level security guard. Uh, someone like that, you know, you know casual labourer, whatever, which is, and then that 85 to 70, that's the difference between that and being mentally retarded. So we have expanded the proportion of society that are mentally retarded. And uh, 15 points, think to what that means. The, the average person in Victorian England, in late, late Victorian England, would have been intellectually capable of being a high school science teacher today. That's what that means. But that, what was that person doing? He was working in a factory or working on a farm. Yes, a, f- a, farm, a farm hand of the 1880s could be a, could be a school, teacher, school today. teacher today, right? And, and a school teacher of the 1880s could be a, well, a well, university professor of today. Right, exactly. And then the university professor of then, he doesn't exist. He's boiled off. Yeah. Except it's slightly more complicated because obviously higher education has expanded. There's more people that go that, go, that work at universities now, and so in that sense, the IQ of the university professor has gone down. Um, but it's, it's slightly more complicated. But what mm. you can basically say is the geniuses, the, the smart fraction of 1880, were one standard deviation above the smart fraction of today, mm-hmm. and the like the. The people, the, the, the whatever, the, the chavs, whatever you want to call them, you know, the, the dinos, yes. this new word I've learned, yes. they, um, they simply didn't exist in 1880. Because they just wouldn't they, have made they, it. We hadn't, IQ had not gone down that far. They, they, they didn't exist. And the, pe- and the people that are the sort of working class of today, as it were, the, whatever, the working in a shop, whatever that kind yes. of thing, they would be on the streets in the workhouse dying in 1880. They'd be right at the bottom of society. Because society was basically harder and you needed to be sharp yeah, but to also make your way through it. Just that they were right at the bottom. So that they, were the, they were the bottom. And now there's a new further standard deviation that's coming at the bottom, um, which is the underclass, which just didn't, but those kind of people just, they just didn't exist. Okay. Uh, that's the opposite of what we used to have. Up until about 1800, it was exactly the opposite. We were breeding for intelligence. And intelligence was going up every generation. That is interesting. Now, an- another fundamental question that I have before I start to get into a little bit more depth on this stuff is, am I right Am I right in any way when I think there are different types of high intelligence? Because I'm pretty sure that I would have made a rubbish auditor because I'm rubbish at detail, but I've made a pretty good investor because I'm good at seeing broad patterns and I don't mind, in fact, I quite enjoy being contrarian. And, and, and I often meet people who are clearly high intelligent, but they just seem to be intelligent to me in a different way. So is it, are there different types of high intelligence or is it just how you apply yourself over your life that gets you to that point? Um, so first of all, with the intelligence pyramid I mentioned earlier, mm. um, there is a correlation uh, of, I don't know what it is, 0.5 or whatever, um, between spatial, on average, between spatial intelligence, mathematical intelligence, and linguistic intelligence. Normally, people that are good at one are good at all three. Now, and then you get this G factor that underpins it for that reason. But there are variations. So you're going to get some people that are very, very linguistically tilted, very, very high linguistic intelligence or whatever. Very good poets or writers or lawyers, but they might be very poor spatial intelligence to the extent they can't drive a car. Like AJ Eyre was an example of that. Uh, Couldn't drive a car. Or Einstein used to just get lost. Or um, and then um, and then uh, uh, you're getting other people again, very good at maths, whatever. But the the tongue-tied physicist or whatever, not very linguistically intelligent. They are unusual, but they exist. Or you might even get someone that has very high linguistic intelligence or whatever, but he's in something lower down the pyramid of intelligence, as it were, like maybe he has very slow reaction time, very slow processing speed. So Mm -hmm. these kinds of variations exist, and that's going to affect how good you are at certain tasks. What you also get, it's called the cognitive integration effort hypothesis, um, is that the more intelligent you are, the weaker is the positive manifold between the different kinds of intelligence. So as you become, let's say you've got really high IQ, 145, really, really high IQ, then you might be absolutely rubbish at some of the things that are at the base of the pyramid that I mentioned earlier, the uh, cognitive abilities that are are specialised abilities, uh, modules uh, that are weakly associated with general intelligence. 
And so then you're going to get you get these extremes, like these geniuses, like Einstein or whatever, you know, or Newton. You, know, you might be highly intelligent, but you have absolutely no social skill. Now, the correlation between social skill and intelligence is about 0.3, something like that. So it's weakly associated with intelligence. Uh, you, you have no social skills. And, and that kind of thing becomes more likely among the very, very, very intelligent. That, they, that they're brilliant, over, brilliant overall, very high IQ, but they're rubbish at, th- at certain things that are weakly associated with IQ. Did, did that come into being because they're sort of a fluke and they're not meant to be that intelligent and some, something in their creation has led to this? That's a very interesting point. Um, there, there is some evidence that geniuses are a consequence of unlikely but possible genetic combinations. Right. And so this means that you're going to get reasonably intelligent parents that, ju- that just by genetic chance, unlikely but possible combinations, create a genius, which is i.e. a person of outlier high IQ, uh, normally combined with a certain kind of personality, subclinical psychopathology, yes. autism, that sort of thing. Um, so that's that's true. And then it doesn't breed true in the children. So the, the genius then marries whatever, the children, just normal level IQ. It doesn't breed true in the children. Um, okay. um, to the extent that they have children, which they often don't. And that's another thing. You know, they're bad at social skills. They're not interested in things that ordinary people are interested in. They're not interested in sex or whatever, some of them. And so, and so, um, so yeah, so you, you, you can get that possibility that you will get somebody, as you say, who has a, a, a certain narrow kind of intelligence. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.